Okay, so no, so that's can uh, hopefully that's that's um it says it's recording on my end. But yeah, but I have this other um this uh, other thing that we'll set up for okay. me. Um and so okay, so it is recording. I just saw that it's recording. Okay, all right, perfect. Okay. So once again, let me just begin by saying thank you so much for um, thank you so much for agreeing to do this interview. It's um, I've looked at it and I went through your interview, which I probably should have done way back ten years ago. I can't even remember. Did you have out the book already? And no, the book is not done. Which is the people want the people the people want the book. And so essentially, what how long has the work been in, in in the works? How long I'm sure ten years now. But because you know I'm doing other things, but they want the. Did you get an advance and everything? I got. Well, we don't get advance. They don't get academic. No. This is for the, oh, this is for the university. This is not yeah. a private. And, yeah, but yeah. we don't get like some people do get advance, especially if they're doing trade press. I'm not doing a trade press. I'm doing a university trade a university press. What I do get is um is an advanced contract. So this is not necessarily money making. I think that for the first book, I I probably got. Maybe fifteen hundred dollars total over the last ten years, right? But yeah. um, but hard to build to build that level of that legacy that you're building. And exactly. So it's yeah, it's so important. Yeah. Thank you yeah. so much for capturing this. This is historic, yeah. historic evidence, you know? Yeah, exactly. So it's not precise. Yeah. So it's not like people. Say, I'm like I tell people I'm like, well, I'm not making money. Like this is not money. This is the the, the no, I know that. I just thought, oh my God, if it's taken a decade, are they going to like, have you no, reached your contract? The calling, the calling. No, it's my calling. It's my yeah, calling. Right, yeah. Right. I mean, I, I got, like, the first book, I remember they sent me a check. It was $250, the first check, and then I get $50, and $70, you know, but whatever. It, it's, it's doing it, right? So you're, you've been a professor now for how long? Forever. I've been at Illinois for 18.25 years. And then, yes, and then I was at St. Cloud for three years. So, yeah, 20 something plus years. Yeah. I know. Congratulations, my Jamaican thank, sister. Yes, thank Congratulations. you. Congratulations. Yes. I'm so proud of you, man, because, and what a time to be an academic and to be writing our stories. What a, what a renaissance yeah. that we're going under. Yeah. And the, the, your work was ahead of its time, and now it's right on time. Yes. Yeah, right? Yes. yes. It's true because when I see all the people, you know, traveling and doing all this stuff, I was like, man, I interviewed people. Like, I was talking to this guy last night. I was like, how old are you? Now he's like 20, 37. I was like, okay, well, I interviewed you when you're 29. I need to get this book done. Like, he is, yeah, because I think I interviewed you when you were 30 something, right? And I'm 53. <laughs> so I was like, okay, the book is going to be done. So I'm on sabbatical, sure. So I'm yeah. on sabbatical, so the book is going to be done, even if it, it right. won't be done. I, I'm, I'm on a leave of absence for my my full time job as well, okay. and I've transferred into my creative realm. I don't think I'll be going back to my uh, work on frontline work. You know, it's okay. too it's too much. It's very stressful, and I've yeah. adopted a little girl. And oh yes, I uh, yeah, yeah, I think I saw you on her on um on on Instagram. That is so yes, cool. and and I have a hubby from Ghana, and it's just a lot. Oh, yeah. oh, is he from Ghana? From from Ghana? Yes, he relocated here in March 2020. Oh, nice. <laughs> the world was and he's like, why am I just not forsaking me? I'm sure. But that's oh. great. Yeah, my friend, um, she's dating, she's dating someone. Um, she's dating someone here. Let me. She's dating someone too. Well, we'll talk about that at the end. And you know, yeah, she's let's on, do our thing. Um, She's like, well, he needs to, whatever. Anyway, we'll, we'll get through that. We'll talk about that. I think it's so good to have with you off record either way. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm so glad your energy is the same. Yeah. I know. Praise God, right? I give God yes. praise. Yes. 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 I still, yes. still try, you know? So anyway, yes. so I'm going to go back. So I have seven questions, eight questions. Okay. And so okay. I don't remember here. what I said or what no, I was no, no, no. feeling at the time. I got so. it all here. I got it all here. Okay. So anyway, um, so basically this chapter, I didn't anticipate when I interviewed you way back 
10 years ago, right? So Got this it. chapter, basically what it is, it focuses on, on, on paid work outside of teaching, even though you did paid work while you were teaching, right? So basically yeah. it's people that focuses on really just four people, Eugenia and these two other people who found other avenues to make money that is yeah. not associated with teaching, except your yes. exception, right? So basically, so I, I read through the entire interview, and so I have like eight questions. All right, so I'm going to start. Well, you're at, this is actually a pivotal time. This is actually really good, because for the first time, I've returned to the arts, and I'm being paid for the arts in a miraculous way, and I call it strategic reparations. Because mm. the grant parents, I've been floating on grants for a year, and I was terrified. I've never stretched my faith so much than to be a full-time creator. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm working with youth with mental health, drug addiction, and homelessness. Christ. And now as a mom, not wanting to be drained and angry and stressed out. Right. And then yeah. working in a, in a toxic work environment where I was being micromanaged. Uh -huh. And I couldn't process the, the data entry and all that stuff. We were doing more paperwork than people work. Right, yes. And I yeah. felt like if I don't crunch these numbers and get these reports in, but my client's in crisis, though, and there's no way to quantify the work that I'm doing in people's lives. Right. And, and I just recently got diagnosed with ADHD and complex PTSD. Okay. And so now that I understand how my brain works, yes. I realize I'm not incompetent, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I think about my parents who didn't know. Yeah. Yeah. My friends who didn't know. Right. I didn't yes. know yeah. how many how many impulsive and emotional and reactionary experiences that I've had. And yeah, you mentioned that. this in the interview too. Like mm -hmm. I don't remember, yeah, you said that you were, that that came up. I think this is also um, you know, divine. But one of the things that you said in the book, you said to me, you said here is that if there's anything that you wanted me um Cornola. you said that if there's anything what you wanted me to do was to apologize to people on your behalf if you said if you write anything in this book i may find it um because i i thought oh wow yeah i think that there is you articulated it in the interview a lot of stuff we went through and now when i read it, i was like oh my gosh no now that there's a diagnosis, it makes sense. So I hope that, that diagnosis is so liberating. Yeah, and I really it's so anti-medication, but if I, ha if I can just get my brain to work in a way that I'm not emotionally and physically exhausted, right, and, right. and that my emotions and my neuro, you know what I mean? Yes, yeah. Diversity yes. is, you know, yes. you know, yeah. a blessing and a curse because of my uh, ADHD, you know, I have creative ideas that are just, they just flood me. I talked to my, my friends. I was like, it's like when people speak in tongues. Yes. Mm -hmm. So when somebody comes to me with something uh, uh, and they're a creative or they're, they have a business idea or something, my brain starts going. So I'm like, get a notepad right now because I don't know what I'm going to come out with and I can't repeat it because I, I think it's just, and it's like God gives me visions. I'm like, you should do this, connect with that, and then it's done, right? So my brain just doesn't stop. And I need it to stop sometimes so that I can calm my nervous system. And so the stress, the high stress living in Asia and the direct anti-black racism and the undiagnosed, you know, the, the, the traumas that were unaddressed. And I'm in such a better space now because I can calm myself. You know what I mean? And I yeah, think yeah. I'm going to rest and I'm not going to do any work and, and the world's not going to fall apart. Absolutely, because I think that we've been socialized to do yeah. that too, you know, especially as black women. This hypervigilance, I, I watched a video on black excellence and how, and she was a believer too, and she's like, I don't care about black excellence. She's Thank like, you. it's extreme capitalism. Oh yeah, well, I'm into black mediocrity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because black mediocrity is still black excellence. Yeah, you know, yeah, and I'm like, yeah, can I be mediocre? Can I just live? I'm so, I'm so over, like, I am so yeah. over all of that. I'm so over, I'm so over. Our parents all. didn't know, they didn't know. They didn't know. Right. Yeah, yes, and they, they just didn't, they just didn't know. But I know that, I mean, that's really fascinating that you, um, um, so I, I stepped away from, you know, that, you know, I said, I, I said, I feel like, it took almost a year, you know, it's like Stockholm Syndrome, where mm -hmm. how do I explain to my family and my friends that I don't want to go back to the government job? 
how do I say I am too stressed out or I am too tired or I am too uninterested or drained? They're looking at you like, what the heck? Yeah. But I, I prayed about it and I asked God and I started writing grants and every single grant that I wrote, I got. Right. So then I got anxiety because I'm like, how am I going to go back to my job? Right. When I had to complete all these projects and God was like, I am your source. I don't want you to go back. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I, I kept negotiating my prayers. I was like, okay, well, that first round is good, but that's going to run out in about six months. Jesus. Right, 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 right. I'm going to have to need a little bit more. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's good. Congratulations on this path that you're that Thank you. This path that you're in my fifties, I'm fifty one and I'm doing the things that I wasn't able to do in my twenties and thirties because there was no space for black artists yes. and creatives yeah. to make a living. Yes, I know. Yeah, yeah, you've mentioned this in here so many times, which I think is why you had all them jobs. Because one, you had a loan, you had to pay yeah. back loans, and then the fact is that Canada wasn't offering what it was mm -hmm. at the time. You know, yes. um, and I see the same thing with jobs now. People keep saying to me, "Hey, when are you gonna apply?" And I'm like, "I'm not. I'm good. I'm good at Illinois. I'm, I'm good. Yeah. Right. I'm good Work right life here. balance and yeah, yeah. and your yeah. calling, like you say, and that whole phrase that I love is like, God doesn't call the qualified; He qualifies the called. Yes. Um, and it's really my life, and all this things that I did in my 20s and 30s are coming full circle because mm -hmm. I was I always felt like I wasn't a successful artist because I didn't get it on the mainstream media. I wasn't in television or films or touring the world or on a major label. But all that work that I did was not in vain. That was my practice. That was my self-taught, self-trained you know, trained right. practice. Yes. And um, wow. Yeah. I was in poetry and then I did hip hop and then I did songwriting and uh and then I, I was interested in acting because Kim Fields was everything to me. She was the first actress that looked like me. I wanted my mother when I was a little girl to put my hair like two D. You know what I mean? And because of her, I get emotional when I see Kim Fields. I'm just like because of her, I wanted to be an actress because she looked like me. And she was sassy like me. And she had braces. I wanted to get braces because we had braces. Right, right, right. right. So I, I was bit by music and acting and songwriting and advocacy and all of those things because I I told my mom I was going to move to New York, you know, because yeah. that's where hip hop lived and that's where blackness was. And that's where Jamaican culture was so infused because we were at that root of that movement. And so I was in the PE at KRS One, and I was like, "Yes, okay, I'm ready," you know. Yeah. And, and so um, you were performing to and right. You were performing a lot, and I, was, and I was in ciphers, and I was doing a lot in Montreal. And my mother would be like, "Where are you going now to do this rap thing? Like, what are you doing?" And I wasn't getting paid, so they didn't understand. Like, right. why would I leave my house and go to this radio station every Saturday for years? like over five years on a regular from seven to nine every Saturday and take my bus there, you know what I mean? And travel outside of my, my suburban home in the dead of the night to do what? Right? Yeah. That was my voice. This was, this was our social media. Everyone tuned in to that show. You knew who was breaking up, who had beef, you understand? Because the shadows were like a double entendre. That was our Twitter. You know what I'm trying to say? That was our... We, saw, we got clapbacks. I had breakups. I did my own breakups, my own clapbacks before there was clapbacks. It was on, if it was said on the radio station during the, everyone's listening to shut ups, trying to read between the lines, right? Absolutely right. Yeah, and synonyms it. and acronyms and, you know, right, right. And right. hidden messages. That was our Underground Railroad, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, so you, that, you that were the good. first, sorry, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm one of the first. One I am first. one of the one of the first. I, I I don't know if there's there's never a one of the first. So I started rhyming in I would say like eighty seven, eighty eight, um, and people got to know me in the nineties. But there are a lot of other MCs. I think of Nova Scotian descent. I think there's a female MC of Nova Scotian descent who was one of the first. Who was the first in Montreal? Um, but I think I became popular because I had an outlet. Right, so mm -hmm. people dubbed me the first, and until I was corrected, I didn't realize. But because people had not, and I also came from the suburbs, there was this whole class issue wow. that why would you, how did this girl from the suburbs, right, from Laval, we were from Laval, Lavalois, 
um, you know, uh, come here and I would, I was never a freestyle rapper. I would just wait until it was time and I would battle with the rhymes that were already written. And I was told uh, people wrote my rhymes because they didn't expect somebody who lived where I lived with two parents and what they consider the Cosby show life to have that level of aggression. But the racism was still real and the anger was still real and the alienation was still real. It didn't matter that I had a nice home. You know what I mean? I was still experienced. I still under the black experience, right? So I was fighting a lot of stuff and I wasn't that well liked in certain circles, but I was respected in others, mm-hmm. you know? And I had my close, you know, friends who were like, you know? Yeah. I was always kind of like outside of stuff in a way. Mm-hmm. All right. So we're going to move to Taiwan. Now. Yes. The next, mm-hmm. So the, the, the next question is as follows. You have a lot of experience in the arts and entertainment. How did these various experiences prepare you for the various non-teaching position roles you pursued in Taiwan? That was my groundwork. Like growing up during a time where things were not done for clout or for followers. Like you, like when I watch, like you know, when you think about Eminem's, um, you know, uh, docudrama, like he captured it so well. Or the real Roxanne, the Roxanne Shante story on Netflix. Like mm-hmm. it was gully. Like, those guys are in the cypher, and I'm like, yo, let me get my turn, let me, and they're like, we don't need a singer, I'm like, I'm not here to sing, we don't need a dancer, I'm not here, just give me the mic, you know, that whole drop the mic and grab the mic, you literally had to physically grab the mic and wrestle it out of somebody's hand, and sometimes you'd be on that stage, and the sound would go out, sometimes you'd be on that stage, and the DJ's needle skipped, you know what I mean, on mm-hmm. the record. Mm-hmm. 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 And that's why you had to have the beatboxer. That's why you had to be able to go a cappella and still rock the, rock the crowd. Like, you have to do it. You had to be the ultimate entertainer. And I think being a Jamaican, I'm like, you can't, like, I have to destroy you today. Right. Like, I have to destroy you today because your only thing is your reputation. That's all you have. And if you go to school and you go back to the club the next week and people heard how somebody destroyed you, that's it for you. There's no other outlet for you. Right? So I'm highly competitive like that. I don't know where I get it from. My ego is just like out of control when it comes to the arts and then mad humble when it comes to other stuff. And so it's a very, it's a, it was a blood sport, literally and figuratively. And I grew up in Montreal where you combine the Jamaican, you know, um, assertion and, and warrior type mentality. So you also worked, you also worked at a radio station as well. That was so tough. I know that I worked at ICRT. Yeah. Gina did much better. Gina handles handled these situations so much better than I did. Uh-huh. I just I can't I couldn't handle some of them. What and was she, your role? You were uh, I was the morning news anchor. You were the morning news anchor. Okay. A friend a friend had held the position previously, but her and her family were moving to Thailand because she got a position as a dance teacher. Yes. Yeah. So oh, she and all she kept telling me was be careful. She didn't tell me anything else. I'm like, what do you mean be careful? She's mm-hmm. just like be careful. It's almost like she didn't. And I feel like, why didn't you tell me more? Were you afraid that I wouldn't take the position, or did you think maybe I could just, you know, navigate around it? And so I experienced some very traumatic things there. I saw. And I mean, it's well done. Handle it. It's well it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You told me right. all about it. Um, but particularly what I wanted to ask you about was, that, did you ever get, an, did you ever interview Desmond Tutu? Did she get I him? did. I did. I interviewed Bishop Desmond Tutu, and I said the silliest, silliest question. The way I phrased it shows you how the anti-Black racism enters our mind. I said to him, my first question was, how did it feel when... We gained our freedom, you know, after apartheid or something like that. And he uh-huh. said, we were always free. Yeah. You know? So, so do you remember, oh my God, this is so exciting because in it, it's not clear that you had, I think that the whole thing was so upsetting for you that it didn't. I was so angry because they were trying yes. to prevent me from interviewing her. I saw that, but I never, it never said in there, in here, um, which is a lesson for me about, um, you know, my next interviews, whatever. Anyway, um, yeah, so it never, we talked about the whole experience, 
And, but I never, so I was left with, I have big, I was like, did you ever interview? My brain sometimes, for all you know, my brain went in so many different tangents. It did, it did, it really yeah. did. It did. So, and I, so yeah. don't, 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 don't doubt your writing skills because my brain is all over the place, right? Right. No, so it was wanted. clear. It's clear in here because there was so much stuff. Like, I was like, oh my gosh. And I should have known, you know, but it, it is what it is. So you interviewed, okay, so you worked on ISIS. So after, after, after asking them, there was some sort of democratic organization or something, 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 some sort of human rights charity organization. And they were so happy to have Bishop Desmond Tutu there. And so I'm working at ICRT. Like, I'm not just some regular person trying to interview this person. Right. But I also happen to be black. So, like, let's just go there, right? You want to talk about close apartheid and then and then in, like, in apartheid on? Like, what are we doing, right? And we were part of a group called Des Descendants of African People, which was that great community grassroots organization uh, that a young African-American woman had started. So I'm like... I'm a DAP member, I'm on RCRT, and I'm black, and I'm a journalist. I need this interview, and we're in Taiwan. Like, are any black people going to be in the room? And I don't think there were any other than me and Bishop Desmond Tutu, right? And had I not been there, he would have been the only one, right? And there's a large black community in Taiwan, and they didn't even reach out to us, right? Mm -hmm. So when I asked them, they said, I'm sorry, I don't think that, you know, it's already been booked up, da 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 And then I said, well, and I don't know if they did it by email or by phone. And I said something along the lines of, it was be very highly disappointing to know, for Bishop Bruce Desmond Tutu to know, mm -hmm. that a black journalist is yes. being denied the opportunity to speak to him. Post -apart. Like, and, that, and so I always have to do these, fire these shots to get into spaces, yeah. you know? Something that similar happened here when I had to interview Jamie Fox. Something very similar happened here with that. And I was like, what the heck? In also in Taiwan, Jimmy Fox? No, in Ty Toronto, I remember something similar happening when I had to interview him when he was releasing the Ray Charles movie. And I had to go around. And we were invited to the press, but then I wasn't allowed to. So yeah, so uh, with Bishop Desmond Tutu, I just remember that one question. I may have asked some others. I cannot find the recording. I don't know where my things are. I don't know. But I do remember asking him how it felt once we were, you know, freed from apartheid mm -hmm. and him saying, you know, mm -hmm. um, they didn't give us the freedom. That's a God-given right. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, and we, you know, he's something to the effect of then we, we were able to embody that God-given freedom. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, but I felt ashamed that I didn't think twice about how I phrased that question. But he was still very kind and very patient. Right. And my favorite quote, quote from him, which you know people have quoted all the time, is uh, you know, when the Europeans came, we had land and they had their Bible and they asked us to bow our heads and close our eyes and then we open our eyes and they had our land and we had their Bible. And yet he's still a bishop, right? So it's like that, that conflict, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As believers or black believers. Yeah, yeah, I, that's amazing. So I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad, so I'm glad that you interviewed him. I'm glad you had to interview the, um, the opportunity to interview him. So that's mm -hmm. wonderful. I'm mm -hmm. glad we're really doing this interview because, boy, the information. I mean, my mind was probably so jumbled and my brain was so scattered. Yeah, yeah. But I, I, I think I had a lot to share and I was so happy. You did, you did, you did. Yeah, you did. I, and, uh, yeah. And so, anyway, let me finish this up and then we'll just chat about some other things. Um. So you mentioned performing, singing at a number of events, launch parties, etc. Mark Jacobs spring wear, I think Moe, Moe Champagne. Moe, Moe Chandon, yeah. It, yeah, Chandon, is it Chandon? Moe Chandon. Yeah, Moe Chandon. I think it's C H A N D O N. Something like that. Okay. Yeah, but it is a champagne company. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything else? We're getting cases and cases and cases of Moe.